Hi, I'm Max Kaiser. This is the Kaiser Report. So much happening in Paris. Max and Stacy are taking it all in. Geopolitics gone berserk. Australia, France, the UK, all battling it out in what appears to be a New York bum fight. Stacy. <laughs> right. Well, because we are in the fashion capital of the world, Paris, our last episode here, uh, we will say the fashion in diplomacy seems to be New York style. New York born Boris Johnson was in the White House last week. And what he said to the French, to Macron, his message was get a grip, give me a break. He said it in French, bad French, I might say, even worse than mine. But here in France, Macron says to Scott Morrison, essentially, not verbally, but through his actions, he's saying, take a hike, buddy, scram, get lost, pound sand. He won't return Scott Morrison's calls. So um, I Who's think that? this is Macron versus uh, Scott Morrison, who is the prime minister of Australia, who dissed France by uh, secretly negotiating a deal with the United States for the, to break the contract with France for $90 billion worth of submarines, the Barracuda class from France. Instead, he's going with the nuclear-powered submarines from the United States. Yeah, I love the uh, tenor of the scrappiness of the dialogue between these three countries. Macron's proving to be a real thug uh, in his uh, verbal uh, pronouns pronouncements. And uh, Boris Johnson, of course, it, it was already a kind of a <laughs> bit of thug to begin with. And he would say, print and grip, you know, get a grip. Here's a guy, you know, hasn't combed his hair in 35 years and uh, never walked by a buffet platter that he didn't stop at for several hours at a time and gorge himself. And uh, so they're really getting into the street brawl. Australia's out there in the middle of nowhere, uh, you know, becoming bat crazy island. So uh, I guess this is all part of the deglobalization, de-dollarization, depopulation themes that we talked about coming up for 2021, 2022. It's all playing out in real time. But I'm, I'm liking Macron in this fight. If, if, as, as a bum fight, I think the odds are Macron is going to uh, come out on top. Uh, really, uh, he's got the EU behind him. And remember, after Brexit, Boris Johnson's got holding in his hand basically a pair of twos, right? He's all talk. He's got nothing. After Brexit, remember, the UK is a neutered, spent uh, country. Well, indeed, France has the, the history of the clochard, which is a more elegant bum, right, that lives under the bridge, uh, with fine wine and champagne and, uh, you know, hanging out with the likes of Serge Gainsbourg. And, uh, you know, it's a little bit more romantic here than what you see. In well, historically, <laughs> France has been the winningest country in history when it comes to war. Uh, they've won more wars than any country uh, on Earth. That's uh, historically. interesting. So I think they're going to be back to form. Uh, I think it's uh, cross-channel fisticuffs are back in play. And I'm liking Macron in this. I'm taking Macron in six. Well, of course, I guess the French, one thing you see here, if you've ever lived here, like we have for a long time, is, you know, there is more of a fisticuffs sort of thing. It's a normal, like, you know, you see, remember, Macron got punched here. Uh, Sarkozy was often very, like, right in the face of his uh, voters and the constituents, the people, the citizens of France. You know, there's often a hand-to-hand -hand combat going on. Yeah, because neither country allows guns, right? So in the UK, it's more of knives are really the uh, weapon of choice. In France, there is a lot of brawling uh, on the streets, uh, but usually at the point of no return. Because of Napoleonic law, uh, people are assumed to be guilty until proven innocent. So you go immediately to jail. Uh, that's why... Uh, you don't really see a lot of street brawls. But it, when it does get testy, it does, it does start to get nasty. Usually at the sign of one participant accusing the other of being a collaborator. That's collabo. A collabo. <laughs> uh, the, next, the next moment after that is a punch in the face. So Boris Johnson said, uh, Prenez un grip, donnez-moi un break. That's how he said it. Uh, I'm just repeating him. So give me a break, get a grip. Now, in... Um, of course, like I said, the clochard, uh, the, the under the bridge, champagne swilling bum here, uh, it's a lifestyle, right? Uh, they're celebrated here in French literature, art, history. Um, you can't be a proper clochard without a bottle of champagne. And in the news over the past weeks while we were here, 
uh, is the Moe Shandong, the workers there, went on strike because they were not given the prime Macron. And the prime Macron is a thousand euro sort of bonus that all workers making under three times the minimum wage, which is about 55,000 euros per year. They're supposed to be given an annual bonus of a thousand euros in well, kind of like collaboration, that we're all in this together, right? This came because of the gilets jaunes uh, in, at the end of 2018. So 2019, 2020, all the workers here who made less than 55,000 euros collected a bonus of 1,000 euros. But Moe Chandon this past year uh, for 2021 has decided not to pay this bonus. So the workers went on strike for this 1,000 euros. Just to put it into context, these articles, Moe and Chandon workers go on flash strike in France. Bernard Arnault is the wealthiest man in the world as of this last year, worth $189 billion. Of course, that goes up and down. But importantly, Moe and Chandon is one of LVMH's most valuable wine estates, producing approximately 30 million bottles of champagne each year. LVMH, the parent company of Moe, Dom Perignon, Vouv Clicquot, and Krug announced record profits for the first half of the year earlier this year. The group recorded a revenue of 28.7 billion euros in the first half of 2021, a year-on-year -year increase of 56% compared to the same period in 2020. Right, chilling like a poet sipping moet. I remember from my days in the hood. Now, Bernard Arnault. This is actually a multifaceted story because he is the world's richest man, give or take, on any given day. He recently bought Tiffany's in America for a, as a gift from the European Central Bank, which is now run by Christine Lagarde. Essentially, because some of the bonds to buy, to purchase Tiffany's, came from negative bearing bonds from the EC because the ECB is buying up all the corporate bonds. So he essentially was gifted Tiffany. He was gifted Tiffany's. Uh, the cost of acquiring Tiffany's was negative, uh, which contributed to his becoming world's richest man. Uh, so it was a gift from the central bank. The central bank is, this is how central banks create wealth and income gaps. If you're Bernard Arnault, you get paid to borrow money and buy huge income producing assets like Tiffany's. If you're working as a worker at this uh, company, you're battling for every thousand euros uh, in the streets, you know, uh, protesting, inhaling tear gas, battling the police uh, because of the central bank. So it all comes back to the central bank, the European Central Bank in this case, and of course, Christine Lagarde. Uh, uh, who runs the European Central Bank currently. So this is how central banks and the population are in contest with each other. I think now with the UK speaking such poor French, which is the highest possible insult you can, you can really foist onto the French, the gilets jaunes and the other internal strife that's going on in France, instead of being internalized, will be projected externally. So now all the gilets jaunes and all the protesters and all the acrimony in France is going to be projected at Le Roast Beef, <laughs> the Brits, as it should be. And I like, I like France's chance of this because uh, the UK has got to import everything. And the Brexit played, made them this, you know, um, uh, island of misfits out in the middle of the North Atlantic that nobody wants to talk to anymore and they can't bring anything in there. Certainly Boris Johnson seemed to have intentionally spoken bad French. <laughs> Donnez-moi. Donnez-moi. Like, I, I think he's fluent in French. I know his brother, who we've interviewed here in the studio, is uh, fluent in French. Um, nevertheless, so Bernard Arnault, by the way, um, of course, said he was going to give like a billion or so to the Notre Dame Cathedral. We uh, passed by that here while we've been in Paris. And um, Max's very good old friend, who is uh, born and raised in Paris, when Max asked him about, oh, wh what were you doing on the day that you know, Notre Dame burned down. This is uh, tragic. And he's like, <laughs> that's the French way. <laughs> he's like, it's just a building. I think it's like more like foreigners think this is very important. I understand. <laughs> Max, you were stunned. You went silent. You had no response. Well, Arnaud, as I understand it, welched on that commitment. <laughs> he's not know. putting up the cash. 
He was all emotionally driven the day after and things are on fire. He goes, I'll put a billion euros into this thing. Then a week later, he's like, oh, wait a minute. I forgot I'm a greedy guy who likes to buy companies with free money from the central bank. I'm not even, I mean, he could borrow a billion euros from the central bank, ECB, for zero or less than zero and use it to rebuild Notre Dame. But no, would he even do that for his country? Well, I don't know. You have to go Google it on your own because I don't know whether or not he came through with that money. But the point is, let's talk about that wealth and income gap and the uh, the central bank, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve Bank, all the central banks of the world uh, fostering and um, basically pushing this wealth and income gap. Last week, the big news, of course, was Fed Chief Powell, other officials owned securities, central bank bought during the COVID pandemic. So you had all of the Fed uh, presidents, many of them ha actually owned a lot of the securities that the central bank itself was then buying. Uh, at a premium uh, to keep the system alive, right? So they were earning money by their own um, using the taxpayers' money. So Rosengren, he said he would sell his individual positions and stop trading while he is president. <laughs> so he was trading. He's the Boston Fed President Eric Rosengren. Dallas Fed President Robert Kaplan, who actively traded millions of dollars of individual stocks, also said he would no longer trade and would sell his individual positions. But he said his trade did not violate Fed ethics rules. OK, we'll, we'll take you at your word. Um, right. So they were actively trading during this time, those two in particular, the Dallas Fed and the Boston Fed president. So here's another central bank. So we go from the European Central Bank to the Federal Reserve Bank and the satellite central banks in America that make up the Federal Open Market Committee. They are printing money and buying stocks that they own to jack the price higher. That's outright corruption. And again, it makes huge wealth and income gaps. If the average person working at Costco or McDonald's could print their own money and to buy the stocks of Costco and McDonald's, they'd be happy enough to do that. But they can't. That's called counterfeiting. But when Jay Powell commits counterfeiting, and let's be clear, this is counterfeiting by any legal statute. This is counterfeiting to buy back your own stock, to ingratiate your own self. That's the highest order of corruption. The Richmond Fed president, Thomas Barkin, did hold like 1.35 million to 3 million, somewhere in between there, in individual corporate bonds. And of course, the, like with LVMH, the central bank of the United States started buying these corporate bonds. So major corporations in America, they were all bought, his bonds were bought, uh, kept afloat by the taxpayer, by the central bank. I mean, it's no surprise. Apparently, this is the fashion. And let's give the peasants a word for this, uh, you know, let them eat brioche moment. Get a grip. Give me a break. That's a good one. They should all shout at the central banks. Give me a break, buddy. Give Get a, a grip. Break. Give me a break. Wow. Speaking of double dose and quantitative easing, we're going to take a break and come back with much more Max and Stacey right after this. Don't go away. Welcome back to the Kaiser Report. I'm Max Kaiser. Yeah, it's a double dose, double dose of Max and Stacey here in the Kaiser Report. We've got so much to cover here in Paris where we've been camping out for a couple of weeks, checking out what's happening in the EU, home of Christine Lagarde. Uh, yes, Stacey, what else? Also, while we've been here in Paris, one thing I want to observe is that a lot of the shops on the Champs-Élysées, we saw a lot of major shops closed. If you walk down any shopping street, they are closed. There is a lot of um, economic impact from the COVID lockdowns and the pandemic. However, if you go up the Champs-Élysées to the Arc de Triomphe, you see it covered in Cristo. This is the, um, you know, celebrated who is the artist who wrapped things, right? <laughs> he had wrapped Pont Neuf, I believe, uh, like 20 years ago. Of course, Christo is dead now, but he died in 2019. But this is something he worked on for decades, actually. So they've wrapped the Arc de Triomphe in the Place de Toile. Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's the last of the Christo wrapping art projects, posthumously put together here in Paris of the Arc de Triomphe. And, you know, when you hear about it, they're going to wrap the Arc de Triomphe in cloth. You know, it sounds like not very interesting, but when you actually see it, it does really pop out. And it's it's a stunning work in, in many ways. And uh, it makes you re-look at things and, uh, and re-examine things and uh, reassess 
your point of view and how you see things. And I think that's one of the great functions of art to, to rejigger your imagination and refocus you and reorient you. And it certainly does that. It's a massive structure and it's massive. It's huge. It's a huge art piece. And uh, so we were very lucky to see that. I noticed that John Najarian, our friend from um, CNBC and other places, remarked that we we're very, very lucky to have seen this in person. And I could tell that he had come and bear envy uh, where he sits in New York City and Chicago, just tasting the uh, foie gras and, and not being able to sink his teeth into it. Ha, 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 John. Well, of course, this theme of this episode is the New York is in fashion. Give me a break. Take a hike, buddy. Get a grip. Scram. Get lost. This is the, this is the geopolitics of our time. That is the fashion. Um, however, on the other side of it, what we've been seeing, uh, you know, the markets have started their typical autumnal sort of uh, volatility. Everybody's a little bit worried things are going to fall apart. And once again, you know, back in 2008, remember, it really started in China, which was the first major market to have like a 10, 15% fall in one day earlier in the year, in January of that year. And I think that ended up triggering all the rest that followed. Here again, we could see similar. Now, Wolf Richter, I believe, has a totally different take on what's happening in China than you, but I'm going to uh, talk about what's, what his view is of what's going on. China's crackdown on debt, tech, and Evergrande sends frazzled Wall Street titans to China. First, I'll tell you about those frazzled Wall Street titans. These are genuine titans <laughs> go like pleading to Chinese government officials to rescue their markets because they were unwilling to. They were letting things fall apart for a specific reason, according to what Wolf Richter believes. But I'll tell you about the Wall Street titans first. A Wall Street delegation composed of top executives from Goldman Sachs, mega asset manager BlackRock, private equity firm Blackstone, Citadel, Fidelity, among others, had a three-hour powwow last Thursday with Chinese regulators that included the vice chairman of the China Securities Regulatory Commission and the head of the People's Bank of China. There was no official announcement, but sources talked to Bloomberg about it. According to these sources, Chinese regulators defended the crackdowns and said they were designed to strengthen regulations, improve data privacy, which is an even funnier concept in China than in the U.S., strengthen national security, and reduce social anxiety. President Xi is going through this thing where it's like common prosperity. There is a, a huge robber baron sort of wealth and income gap. Uh, getting worse and worse during this time of pandemic and money printing where the, the, the very wealthiest are getting mega wealthy. We've seen that in the United States with Elon Musk up at 200 billion, Bezos up at 200 billion. They were only worth like 50 billion before the pandemic or 60 billion. Now they're worth 200 billion. Bernard Arnault here in France. He's French. He's worth, uh, the, he's the richest man in the world, um, despite allegedly having some of the highest taxes in the world here. Right. I'll take the cynical view and say that uh, BlackRock was in China trying to convince the CCP that more quantitative easing in Washington would bail out Chinese property developers and that, in fact, me, the taxpayer of the United States, would be now helping to bail out Chinese property developers. What is Wolf Richter's view? Wolf Richter's view about what China is doing regarding these crackdowns, and we've seen them over the past year or two, right? Like major crackdowns on the likes of Alibaba and stuff. So here's his assessment of what's going on in terms of all the crackdowns across, especially big tech. The crackdowns by Chinese authorities on some of the biggest hype and hoopla industries have sent investors heading for the exits. There's a crackdown on debt to keep the financial system from imploding. There's a crackdown on property speculation to tamp down on housing prices and on debt. There's a crackdown on big tech, mostly internet, social media, and online gaming companies for their monopolistic size and practices and a slew of other issues. There's a crackdown on education tech companies that sell off-campus educational courses that have driven the cost of education into the sky, discouraging Chinese couples from having more than one child. There's a crackdown on all kinds of other activities that include reporting financial news and analysis in a way that the government doesn't approve. So he believes it's like he's that the government is trying to prevent a US style situation whereby 
the social media companies are far more powerful than the president of the United States, who could be a memory hold while he's still in office. Like, maybe there's a blank there. Nobody knows who's, who's in the White House. There's just skip number 45, for example, while he's in the White House. Right. Well, China's doing what Paul Volcker did in the 1970s by exercising a government fiat to tamp down speculation. Remember, Paul Volcker drove interest rates to 16, 17, 18 percent to stop inflation and to bring price discovery back to the markets. And China's acting in a Paul Volcker style. Now, in America, starting with Al Greenspan and continuing with Bernanke and Janet Yellen and now Jay Powell, they believe that they, it's up their, their purview to reinterpret the role of the central bank. And as Greenspan has said, Greenspan has said that they don't try to manage the economy anymore. They, they're only there to clean up the mess when bubbles pop yeah. by printing more money, which creates another bubble. So the question is, who's a better central banker? Is it China, because they're acting as a central banker? Because it's all amalgamated into one uh, office, the CCP. They're doing the banking and the politicking. It's one, it's one communist Politburo. Or is it the Federal Reserve Bank? Or is Russia? You know, Elvira Natalaba is uh, raising interest rates aggressively and uh, proving to be the best central banker of them all, either U.S., China, or Russia. And I know I mispronounced her last name, as I always do. I got her first name right, though, Elvira. Well, again, this is the fashion of this episode is New York. So New York is like, you know, we just mispronounce everything in New York. Have you ever been there? New York. New York. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to mispronounce New York. Hey, Elvira, you know, you know who I'm talking about, right? I can't get your last name, but you got your first name. You, have, you run the Russian Central Bank. Your name is Elvira. That's all I need to know. You're doing a good job. China, they're figuring it all out. They're capitalists just for like 30 years. And Americas, they gave up. They're just printing money like <laughs> So, uh, the, the days of central banks and fiat money are over, though. So uh, I think at the end of the day, uh, there is no central bank policy in Bitcoin and the Bitcoin world in which you and I live. So um, we're just observing on outside the Bitcoin world. Uh, we're watching the uh, machinations of central banks and trying to control all of the uh, fingers in the, the dike sort of thing of like trying to stop the, the tsunami of bad debts, crushing everybody. And China has their own unique style. America has their own style. Christine Lagarde has her own style. Um, nevertheless, the last two headlines here are the consequence of, of all the money printing. Tesco warns Christmas panic buying could be worse than first lockdown due to driver shortage. So Tesco, Britain's biggest supermarket, alerted government officials to the potential impact of the ongoing shortage of HGV drivers in the run-up to the festive season. So we have it like a perfect storm of all sorts of, um, you know, things colliding, money printing, uh, work from home, a lot of stimulus checks. But also during the lockdown, um, you, ha you have like you know, the whole training process of training drivers for these uh, driving the big rigs, the 18-wheelers the food delivery trucks, uh, they've all been locked down and shut down because of the pandemic. So there's no new drivers coming on, plus with Brexit, plus with border closings all over the world because of the, the pandemic. You, you have a shortage of drivers everywhere. You have it in the United States. You have it in the UK. You have it probably in France. So they're all trying to poach each other's drivers. In the UK, in the food sector, the retail sector, there's a shortage of 500,000 drivers. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, 500,000 employees in that whole sector, about 100,000 drivers. So, uh, that's a huge number of people to try to uh, poach from other countries to come drive trucks for you. Uh, right. Well, the UK usually generates some interesting artifacts during their drawdowns and economic malaise. I remember during Victorian days, we gave us Charles Dickens and classics like A Christmas Carol. Then during Thatcher's Day, we gave us punk rock and the rise of the Sex Pistols and other great bands like that. Uh, now we have kind of the 21st century Boris Johnson collapse, and the people there will be stuck in their figgy puddings, crying in their mincemeat pies all Christmas long. But, and it would be tragic if it weren't also comical, because but, they voted this for themselves. Brexit, thank you. They Fortunately, in the UK, they, of course, have those, like, Christmas meal in a can. Right, right. <laughs> Christmas meal in a can. You simply <laughs> open up the tin, and in there is stuffing, turkey, cranberry, <laughs> gravy, and some pumpkin pie, all in Christmas in a tin. That's what's coming to you at Tesco.
if you live in the UK. And it, <laughs> good but, stuff. But there will be no new supply, according to Tesco. It'll be the so new you... version. It'll be made out of cardboard, uh, synthetic rice, uh, drippings from a dustbin in Surrey, topped off by minced meat, the virtual rat meat. Mmm, yummy. Or you could possibly use stuff that you had in your cupboard from 10, 15, 20 years ago. And finally, in, the, uh, in terms of the inflation, U.S. rents increased by double digits in August. So the first time uh, we've seen double-digit increase in rent. According to the apartment list, the median national rent climbed 13.8% in the first month, eight months of 2021. On a year-over-year -year basis, the median national rent rose 12.5% in August. Going back to the New York fashion, there was a guy, the rent is too dang high party. Well, the rent is too dang high, and it's going higher, and it's going faster. Right, and according to Joe Biden, it has nothing to do with money printing. Ha ha. Well, that's it for Max and Stacy on the Kaiser Report. Until next time, bye, y'all.